families is the most common family size in the world, you know. And the number of children in the world have stopped growing. This is the most unrecognized fact. We had the peak child, peak oil we are discussing, but peak child, we are just in peak child now. And there will be two billion children in the world for the next hundred years to come. How can the population then increase with two billion? No one is born after being a child. I've never heard about that. So I have developed a completely new prototype to explain this, which we will display for the first time here. And could I have some check here? Yes. Because no one should think that this is magic, you know. All right, I'm going this to... is the world population. Each toilet paper roll is one billion people. These so are I, have the... a, I have a billion people here. Yeah, yeah. I'll put them be down. Be careful, be careful. Uh, these are the children below 15 years of age, two billion. These are the ones between 15 and 30, 2 billion. These are 15, uh, sorry, 30 to 45. This is your group, 45 to 60. And this is my group, 60 and above, you know. And, you're, and, looking, you're looking a little teetery there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, we are sort of shaking it, Parkinson and so up there. <laughs> uh, now, what will happen the next 15 years? The old one will die. Sorry for me. <laughs> the rest will grow older and they will get two billion children. Then these ones will die, the rest will grow older and get two billion children, and then these ones will die and they will grow older and get two billion children, and there you are, 10 billion people in the world. No magic, and if you have these devices at home, you can check yourself when you come home. <laughs> but this is really what will you, happen. You've you see? If I do it like this, you know, here they doesn't grow any longer. They can continue to do like this for a long time. You, you do this a lot, play with toilet paper? Oh, yes. yes. We call this the great fill up. Can I, can the I take, next I billions are already born, and what we will see in the future is this will happen. Here is where they are, the seven billion. One billion in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and one, two, three, four in Asia. And there will be two billion more, one in Africa and one in Asia. And if I show you the real important thing here is when I have each person here is now 100 million. This is up to 15 to 30 to 45 to 60 and 60 and above. The Europeans are here, boring people, same amount in all there. Americans almost as boring. Africa dynamic population pyramid. Asia like this, but with the same amount of people down here. Now I'll show you what will happen in the world. All right, Hans, we need you back on stage here. I mean, you know, you're getting... That's the big fill-up. This is the fill-up, and this is the aging. This is what will happen. The one people, two and a half billion of the increase is already born. There's nothing we can do about it. We have to plan for a future, considering the risk for climate change with nine to 10 billion people. Thank you, Hans. Could, could you autograph the, the billion oh, people yes, for me? Know. That's right. Just, I just want to say I have a billion people on a toilet roll. Um, so what we just saw, Olivia and, and, and Jim, is, is a remarkable, I'm gonna, I really am going to keep that, you know. Of course. Is a remarkable way of illustrating data, of illustrating information, of being a little out there, a little funny, employing metaphor, using graphs, color, moving video. What do you make of that? How effective is that? Can you tell a story that way? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I wish that I could, but uh, uh, that's a talent. Does it work? Yes, I think so. I mean, you, you brought bugs to life to do all kinds of nefarious and perverted things, but, but this idea of using metaphor, talk about that and how metaphor as a storytelling device can be a tool here. Well, I think it depends on the extent to which you can in, to, um, engage people's imagination. I mean, for me, science was always about curiosity and trying to understand the natural world. And I think that, that often you can use devices like Dr. Tatiana or like toilet rolls to, to sort of reframe what people are thinking about and, and introduce a whole new dimension of imagination. And so you start to think, okay, well, I know that, I know that for example, when, when a bug writes a letter, it is a metaphor. I'm not saying that there's some sort of, you know, that a praying mantis has the capacity to, to get out the note paper. But I, but I do think that, that it's a very useful 
way to imagine what would the what would the world be like if you were in danger of being consumed during sex. <laughs> <laughs> You've got my attention. <laughs> when you wrote Storms of My Grandchildren, what was your approach to that? Because that you approached very much as who you are, a scientist. Yeah. And I thought that I could write it clearly enough that people would understand it. And what I've learned in the response is, well, yeah, my colleagues understand it. And college-educated people can understand it, and most of them tell me they have to read it twice, and that surprised oh, college-educated people have to read it right. twice? Right, yeah. It, it, who were you aiming for? Who you were trying to well, write for? I was, I, no, I was trying to write for the public. So now my theory, <laughs> suggested by my son-in-law, is write a book that my granddaughter, who's now 13 years old, can understand. So I'm thinking I will write one maybe called Sophie's Planet. And I will, I, will, I will give her each chapter and, and ask her if she understands it. And You're tell nodding me. your head. Why are you nodding your head? Sophie's planet. Yeah, but it's very important to take the target group for that and to realize that we have different target groups yes. uh, for different informations, you know. It would be terrible if all the science communication were running around with toilet rolls. It would destroy <laughs> my future, you know. It would so, destroy the planet, too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it's, so it is that, but if you really, the problem is often when you write about your own things that you are too close to them and you make it too complicated. That's why the best science communication are done by those who determine I'm a journalist, I'm a communicator, I'm a writer. I, I see very few scientists who can reach that excellence. But do you worry that in making it simple, you make it too simple? In making it clear, you may run the risk of dumbing it down. No, I don't worry about that. At all? I think that it's always, there's, there's always a sort of tightrope to walk when you can oversimplify. But, but I think that the art, of, the art of reaching out to a wide audience is, is, I mean, one of the things that I didn't like about television, particularly doing television in, in the United States, was that the broadcasters held their audience in contempt. And so, for example, we had a line, the blue milkweed beetle has a composite eye for a good-looking guy. And the word composite was considered to be uh, too difficult. And of course, if you take it out, you don't really have a joke anymore. Not that it was a particularly sort of thigh-slapping joke, but you don't have a joke anymore. And, <laughs> and composite, that's really pretty out there. Isn't it? That's highly, te that's a very technical. You know, term. and and I think that I think that that's a really big mistake. I think that that people, people resent being talked down to, they know when it's happening, and it's unnecessary. I do think that using language that is clear is not the same as, as, as trying to pretend the problem is simpler than it is. But you know, we do have, you have something of a culture clash here, folks, it seems to me, because in journalism and in the public, it needs to be simple. You need to, you know, as we say in journalism, you start with the lead. What's the finding? What's the conclusion, what's the result, essentially. That's at the bottom of the pyramid if, if you're a scientist, right? Because you go through a process to get that. So you're speaking different languages. Jim, no? Yeah, that, uh, pr it is a problem that the public now does not understand science. Uh, and we, I think our, our science writers are not as good as they were a few decades ago, frankly. When I wrote my first paper, there was, that was received attention in 1981, the science writer for the New York Times, Walter Sullivan, was really good. And when he wanted to get comments on this, he called the experts in the field. Now, our science writers will call the, the extremes in the field. And Do you agree with this? Do you agree with this? I think there's a lot of really excellent science journalism. He's saying he's wrong. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, I think I this think is very, and, and journalism is just one. We'll get to some of these other media that you're communicating through in a minute. But we know what's happened to the media, the news media. There have been cuts, some major, major cuts in, in, in science sections. Boston Globe is one of them. I mean, gone in Boston of all places, right? So you have fewer people you can reach out to. I think that sometimes, well, my, my 
I mean, I've, I've, I, I do science communication, I don't study it, so, so I don't know, for example, how effective it is, and I also have an impressionistic um, view of it. But my impressions of when science journalism doesn't go very well or is egregiously wrong, it's often the headline, not the story, that is the problem. So for example, Frankenfoods will kill you, and then you read the story and it turns out that that's not really what it's about at all. Hans. We have excellent science writers in Sweden. I think their main problem is within their media and within their newspapers, you know, to get the right, and to get the headlines and so on. But I would say, the more vulgar and simple you get, you have a problem with oversimplifying. Look at these, these toilet rolls I had. The, the lower two were two billions. The next, I said, was one billion. It was actually 1.4. And the next was 1.3. But in order to simplify it and show that it is the already born who grows up, I simplified it to this extent. But I have to get it right. So I couldn't do 10-year groups. I had to do 15 years group. So you must not be able to do anything wrong. So it is indeed, we are, we are spending lots of time in looking at how we could simplify the data without being wrong. And, and what data, how you boil it down and how you convey it? What's the hardest part when you've got all these numbers and, da and data and, and, and findings? When a reporter calls you on the phone and says, well, are all these, are all these weather disturbances a result of climate change? How do you, yeah. how do you answer well, that question but then still respect the data? Well, that, the problem that scientists have is they want to include the caveats. They want to be skeptical of their own science because that's the way science works. And the public doesn't really understand that. And, and perhaps we need to, in communicating, uh, put a little less emphasis on all of the caveats. But it's, it's a tough trade-off. Hans, here's what I want to ask you. You are a character. You are a character. You're, you're sitting in front of the washing machine and you're throwing around toilet rolls and you're moving bubbles up and down and you're expressive and you're dynamic and you're charismatic, but it's all about you. Is that conscious? Do you have to be a character? No, well, you have to use that. And, and I have to use my credibility as a professor. I've written my 100 paper and graduated my two-digit PhD students. And then I left science. That's very interesting. I had to, to be able to focus completely. That's why I respect media writers and journalists so much now, because how could they produce so much? To find out that with the toilet paper took me half a year together with two people. To the, because we had to iterate and iterate and have fun and test it until we, we, we could get it down. So it's a very high production in, in, in journalist uh, writing. But uh, it was by serendipity I found this out. That, that, that you could communicate. But you saw it today. People didn't know that it's 2.5 children per woman in the world. You don't know that there's less children per woman in the Islamic Republic of Iran than in Sweden. You don't know that in Indonesia today have two children per woman, like US had when Obama came back, 71. You know, it's, 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 I've, been, I've been using something where it's undisputable fact. I don't have the problem which you have where you need the caveat in, in much more ways. These are facts. It's just the, the mentality of the sort of Western mind cannot accept that Indonesia behave the same in the bedroom as U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia, uh, I want to... We'll, we'll not sure the, why you're suddenly turning to me after that statement. <laughs> I actually was going to ask you the character question, but I'm a little nervous about that, too. No, uh, but, but, but um, I'm, I'm thinking of the notion of being a character, I'm thinking of being outspoken and being a little outrageous to get attention. And you've been on television, you know how that works. What's rewarded on television today is the outrageous. What's rewarded is the outspoken. What's not rewarded are the caveats. What's not rewarded is the precision. So how do you effectively communicate in that environment? Well, television is not at all my, my um, main or preferred environment, but I think, that, I think that television has particular challenges, especially for people who are being interviewed, because the, the way that I think about it is that on radio, an hour is a long time, and on TV, five minutes is a long time. And that creates a lot of constraints, and there are other hidden constraints as well, which, which I didn't appreciate at all until I started to do it, which is that television is extremely expensive. Yeah. This makes people very reluctant to take risks. So they tend to, make, so they tend to 
um, follow formulas that they have seen working. Nobody wants to be the person who, who spent $50 million on a program that didn't have any viewers. So it becomes, it, it, has, it has a different set of constraints from anything else I've ever worked but, but, in. But the majority of people get their news from television, cable television, with all the talk shows and the debates, sets the tenor and the tone. The, 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 the anti-science crowd seems to get a prominent voice on television because television ratings reward conflict. That's a very hard thing to fight. Let's look at something else now because... Yeah, the, yeah, but they are failing.